things later on. Uh, this is also the reason why whether you're happy or not to leave you at the video on is really a matter of, we will be happy to see you, but uh, just, to, you know, make yourself as comfortable as possible about that. So after the conversation between um, Catherine and Joe, um, and we invite the public to take part into the conversation. Also, by making use of the chat, uh, you have a, you can see the button down here. I know everybody has become an expert in the use of Zoom. I haven't, but there's a chat, and you can ask your question privately to the person you want to talk to, or to uh, to all of us. We will then make sure your question is you know answered or. Uh, um, made uh, uh, public. Uh, um, you can either add your name or if you want your name to be mentioned. So just behave and take it as uh, if uh, you were in, uh, in person here at the Institute. And also uh, at the, after say 20, 25 minutes of conversation, there will be, um, I would love uh, my colleague in London, uh, Katya to speak about this initiative because it is this is as I said is only the beginning it's the first event of a series of events and uh, um, Fabio Monaco uh, will say a few words about uh, the uh, the fact that we in fact collaborated on the realization of this event and um, I hope that in the future when maybe this is will be the first of many other encounters. Uh, uh, Edinburgh would be, you know, at the center of the conversation. So sorry for having spoken so much and so long. Uh, and I leave it to Catherine and thank you all very much for being here virtually in this event. Thank you. Thank you, Renata. And thank you to everybody. I can see some familiar faces and some familiar names. It's great to have you all here this evening. And thanks also to Fabio and to Katia for joining us. And I can't lay claim to having been born in the North, Renata, but my father was from County Down, so I'll, I'll claim half an interest there. Um, Joe, I am going to start with you and ask you yeah. to read your poem, Hard Borders, and then we will have a discussion about it. And please, at that stage, Fabio and Katia, Please join in at any stage if you would like to contribute. I, I can remember the first time I came across this poem, Joe, um, and I just found so many things about it were so incredibly resonant. And not just because all of the political stuff around the border was going on at the time, but it just as an exploration of two communities trying to live together within the, same, within the same space and all of that being bound together by a border which raised and still does raise more questions than it answers. So if you could start by reading the poem for us first, please. I will do. Thank you, Catherine. Hard Borders. A poet spoke of his nation's mind as bogland. That same home is mine and the nature of it was a border. Every name a nerve and every northern town a flag staked into sodden ground. Where union meets dolmen, I left but found it seeps, how fickle longing is. As clan knots untie, how years make a land, bury old but forget its still stained hands. As if not weed, with its noxious seeds, roots hard as knuckles, stretches deep through soil and peat in referendums. I watch winter clench once again. Trees lose their lungs past expectant green. Hawthorn buds from April suffocate and 98 becomes just a date. The rowan berries sour, decayed and the sun looks backwards, abjuring day. The same poet wrote of blackberries, rotting youthful hope no longer sweet. I left young, my folk were looking to the new. Now they're hunched under harvest weights too few. 
We've succumbed to Puka, red-eyed and cruel, who bedevils our labor in edible stale. To split duchas from haim is to abscond, summer to the cloth unraveling around, our hands held out to be again unbound. Thank you. Always lovely to hear the poet's voice in the reading. Um, just to set the scene a little bit, Joe, because I can see that we have um, people from outside of Ireland who have joined us, obviously, for this conversation. Um, just if we can put a couple of things in context. And I think one of the things which you and I spoke about at another stage was this difference even between saying that somebody is from the north of Ireland or that somebody's from Northern Ireland. Can you talk to us a little bit about what that even tells us about the people who might be speaking? Well, it's it's really a, quite a fluid identity to have, Catherine. It's, um, I mean, I think even the, the idea of Northern, to say you're Northern Irish was really only coined in the 70s. I think the, the police people and so, they use this, it was really a reactive term to the division that was going on at the time. Most people would have classified themselves as Irish or British. Um, so the term Northern Irish is relative modern. It's a strange identity to have, to have a nationality that really has no flag, no anthem, no, no real own culture as such. Um, alone, when you go onto the internet and go on a drop down list of nationalities, it's, you always have to ask yourself, am I going to click on Ireland? Am I going to click on the UK? So it's, it, there's always that question in the mind. Um, I've, it's always been hard, especially living in Europe or living overseas, to define myself to other people. What is Northern Irish? Um, so for me, the difference would be then to say the North of Ireland. I mean, the North of Ireland could be someone from Donegal who has gone through the Irish system, school system, health system, who feels very much Irish, whereas I certainly in Northern Ireland growing up felt neither Irish nor British. Um, so it's a very fluid identity to have. I, I don't know how you would see that. You've obviously got connections yourself. Yeah, I, I think the interesting thing about it is, and I think it's one of the things which the peace process has done, it has allowed people to describe themselves as either or both. Right. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, that mm -hmm. kind of the, the, the acceptance of the fact that it is an identity which has many, many different facets and there's no need to define yourself as one thing or the other. Exactly. The psychological border has gone. Exactly. Well, yes. And, and perhaps Almost. that's something we can come back to yeah. mm -hmm. later. But yes, I think that was one of the real uh, achievements of the peace process, that that psychological border did disappear. But you use a word in the poem which really fascinates me, where even in what you're talking about there, you're talking about the fact that you left but found it seeps. Yeah. So can you talk a little bit around the inspiration? What made you, what brought you to write this poem at, at a particular time in your life? And why do you think it was important for you to write it? I wrote this poem in the run up to the Brexit referendum. Now, at the time, it wasn't just Brexit going on in the world. Donald Trump had announced his candidacy for president. There was a lot of um, suddenly an, a return to an inward looking, nearly a defensive psyche, um, reactive fear. Um, and for me, I was, I was a child growing up in Northern Ireland in the 80s. I was born in 76, growing up in the 80s, the early 90s. I was, I was really the Good Friday generation um, who experienced Bill Clinton coming to Northern Ireland. We were proud. It felt like the country was opening up and looking outwards. Um, from being the small insular country where we were just looking to see the other, what, the, what was the other side doing? It felt like suddenly we, we were looking outwards. People were going on Erasmus programs. People were, my generation had been the generation of doing spirit of Enniskillen ex exchanges, cross community. And now suddenly the whole world was open and we had peace. Um, but then I moved away. I went to university. I lived abroad ever since. Um, and over the years, despite the Good Friday Agreement, there was a backward shift, a backward shift to voting again for parties like the DUP and Sinn Féin. Um, 
And something that I'll be honest, while I was away, I didn't really sense this mood happening. So therefore, when or even within the UK, this growing nationalism, this fear of immigration, um, I didn't sense this from abroad. I was too involved in raising a young family. And watching the build up to Brexit, etc., it actually shocked me. I felt like people had forgotten the years before the Good Friday Agreement and how that had, how, how Trimble and Hume had masterminded this, this peace framework. And it felt like something had shifted backwards yeah. um, for me, which really was almost like a trauma. And that, that was what made me sit down and write this. Um, amongst a few other poems written in that time. I mean, mm -hmm. most of my poems written in 2016 are quite bleak. But, yeah. Yeah. And, and I mean, you, you make references, you make a couple of references in the poem to Heaney. Yes. And talking about, um, he spoke of uh, his nation's not, not mind as bog land. So maybe if you could just explain just briefly to our visitors what you're, what you're telling us with the use of that word. Yeah, well, firstly, I'll, I'll say I grew up in Mid Ulster. I grew up in the same village that Seamus Heaney comes from. Um, so he's always been a, a visionary for me in poetry. He's probably the reason I started to write poetry in the first place. Um, so obviously, Bogland is very is a very symbolic thing in Ireland. At a point, it used to cover, I think, almost a quarter of the Irish surface. It was used, um, obviously, for fuel, the peat, etc. But Heaney wrote a lot about, especially in his collection North, about how it it preserves the culture. It, it's Bogland is like the psyche of a nation. It, it mm -hmm. preserves bodies. It without them decaying. He wrote poems about mummified corpses and yeah. that very much is symbolic of um, the, the Irish mentality, deep and saturated with memory and relics. Um, and I find that a fascinating, and he compared it at the time to the American psyche being very much about frontiers, looking forward, discovery. Um, so I, I also find Bogland a fascinating metaphor for the Irish psyche. Okay, um, and you, you, what you've done is as well with the, with uh, two words in particular. I think that you use you use duchas and you use tame, yeah. both meaning the same thing. The home place, one in Irish, one in Ulster Scots. Can you just talk a little bit about the the coexistence of those two languages when you were growing up? Yeah, well, I mean, for me, growing up as a Northern Irish Protestant, I didn't come into contact with the Irish language at all. Um, it's really only something since the Good Friday Agreement um, I've had more exposure to. I, I grew up surrounded by Ulster Scots um, dialect, where obviously Haim comes from. Um, I, I'm more familiar with Ulster Scots than the Irish language. But for me, it was this the idea of contrasting these two same words for home in different languages, but also there's slight differences, I believe. I believe in Irish, it's more, it means more heritage mm -hmm. in that kind of way, whereas yeah. Haim and Ulster Scots is home. And for me, it also symbolized, even if you forget the two different language, to separate in a country, to separate a heritage from the home is also an important metaphor in Northern Ireland. Um, it's, it's a young country and, and yet in many ways it has forgotten its heritage. Um, symbolic in me. I, I grew up there for 17 years and never heard a word of Irish. So, so yet another border between the two languages yeah. being imposed on the communities. Exactly. But you have, a, you have a little bit of mischief in there using the word puka. Why did you choose to use that mischievous spirit? Oh, I think I think I was a little bit angry when I was writing this poem. And obviously puka is the mythical ruiner of harvests and when people don't take care of their harvests and get them in in time they can be bedeviled they can be they can turn rotten children in ireland were, were told years ago not to eat blackberries after a certain date because the puka would have poisoned them um for me this was a i think i was i was angry at how i was seeing politics in northern ireland turning out i felt like the people had allowed puka to come in and ruin the harvests of a of a peace framework. Um, so I don't know whether that was mischief or if I was having a bit of a dig or. <laughs> oh, well, it doesn't need to be one or the other. <laughs> but... <laughs> 
You also make a lovely reference to the the the, the whole uh, the ancient ritual of hand fasting. Can you tell us why you chose that particular image? Where this is for anybody who, who isn't familiar with it, perhaps you can explain a little bit better, but it is about the, the binding of hands, often in a marriage ceremony, for example, to show that the hands are bound together in love, but that the ties are easily unmade if that is necessary. So what we what did you want to tell us with the reference to hand fasting here? Well I think I think I think you've basically answered that for me in, in that um for me it was um something like the Good Friday Agreement was bringing two communities together um, mm -hmm. in a way, marry, who have coexisted side by side, but to to bring a, a certain amount of harmony, almost a marriage between them. And then to, then to unbind them is obviously the symbolic to let everything fall apart again, this, this idea of division. Um, yes. So. I, I just, uh, I was reading a book recently called The Rule of the Land. I don't know uh -huh. if you're familiar with it. No. With Carr. He's a writer from Donegal originally, now living in Belfast, so he has <laughs> crossed the border. Um, and he actually walks the border. He walks the entire length of the Irish border. Oh, wow. Okay. And he thinks about all of the different, the different issues that walking the border brings to his mind. For example, he talks about there is a kind of border mentality, a way of looking at the world mm -hmm. from those who actually live close to on either side of the border and what this does to their mentality. But one of the lines uh, which is from him, it's not quoted from anybody else, but I just want you to, as you're a, a wordsmith, he makes a, a, a fantastic uh, tribute uh, to the precision and the power of language to bring about the peace process. And he said that people might find it disconcerting that the peace process was held aloft on a spindly framework of linguistic construction pinned together with hyphens, yet it held. Yeah. And I think that there was an enormously comforting line to read how language, as you've done in, in, in your poem, how language was brought to the service of hand fasting those two communities, because uh, George Mitchell said there wasn't one line in that Belfast agreement that hadn't been uttered by one side or the other, that yeah. they had created it, he had simply distilled it. So in another way, it's almost a poetic use um, of language. Of I want to ask either Fabio or Katia if they would like to come in on anything at this stage before we move on to talk maybe about maps and borders in ancient Ireland as well. You're muted, Katia. Unmute myself, okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Catherine and Joe. This is absolutely fascinating. And what's uh, striking me particularly is how your borders map onto many other borders. Um, and all the um, issues that you describe, um, the sort of language, the language, the border mentalities, um, the borders that are inside and outside individuals, the fluid identities, it's a concept that maps onto you know, I dare say all borders, or, you know, it, it's sort of typical, it typifies um, many borders, um, you know, not just particularly the, this, this one that you're discussing. So it's absolutely fascinating because we're dealing with issues that are absolutely universal in a sense, that are, you know, global, that apply um, elsewhere. One of, the, one of the really interesting discoveries for me was, um, that, for example, in ancient Ireland, you know, where you had the Kingdom of Ulster, for example, that because there were no man-made maps, there were no paper maps at that mm -hmm. time. But the idea of being able to map the boundary and the landscape of your home place was so incredibly important that this was something which the ancient bards, the ancient poets did, that they would list the towns and the places that one would pass through on their way from one place to another so that everybody was very clear on where all of those towns, all of those borders, all of those divisions lay. So that even though we didn't have maps or borders in a concrete way on paper as such to refer to, that everybody was very clear in their own heads as to where they were. And it seems to me to be something like just 
as human beings, this ritual to map ourselves onto the landscape, you know, to put something of ourselves into that space, almost as though we can claim it. Yeah. Fabio? So thank you, Joe, and thank you, Catherine. Very interesting. Um, I would like to express, first of all, my gratitude for the invitation on to be part of the project Maps, Borders and Territories devised by my colleagues of London and Dublin Institute. The idea of borders itself is what attracted me to the project. Uh, talking of borders and territories has always been controversial as we um, could see tonight with the poet of uh, Joe. And today, uh, we, we find ourselves in a situation where our borders and our uh, territories seem to get smaller, either for political reasons, uh, or if we think of it, because of the state of emergency we live in. Joe expressed this concept, uh, talking about Brexit, for example. Mm -hmm. And obviously the current situation where we are all committed of to safeguard the common well-being prevents us to move as easily as we were used to. But as we can see tonight, there is something stronger, something that really dissolves the strict idea of border, whatever it is. And this is literature, be it prose or poetry. Mm -hmm. So thank you again, Joe, for uh, to express again this concept and to show us that poetry really can break the, 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 the borders and the territories. Thank you. And what about your experience of Germany, um, Joe? Would you, would, would you see anything familiar in the, in the sense of the two communities coexisting in one place or is it a very different sense? Well, I mean, Germany would have a much more diverse population structure. I mean, it's, it's um, in terms of borders, I mean, we're sitting here in the middle of the EU. Borders are still open and very firmly open. There's no real discussion on that. Um, I see it more on a societal level at the moment. And I see that what what is happening around the world with maybe rising nationalism, um, etc. It's also happening in Germany on their different fronts and has been for a few years. And I think that's going to be a border within the country. Um, I mean, when, whenever in 2015 Pegida came alive, and now we have the situation, obviously with with the AFD, now coronavirus, and a new growing group of QAnon believers, etc. Yeah, it's um, I, I can I can see societal borders and languages becoming divisive. So that again, I can I can sense this border in language building up, um, which we saw happening in the UK, building up to Brexit, how language could div how language could divide or heal mm -hmm. also in the US. And I do see it happening here in Germany as well. Okay. Um, it very divisive and very hostile in the yeah. run up to the Brexit referendum. Yeah. And in fact, the it's, which is something we have discussed and um, the the level of public discourse that came about as a yeah. result of the referendum was, as you say, yet another border because it was yeah. a it was a clear dividing line between people who wanted to discuss something in a civilized manner and those who are calling yeah. old prejudices or old hatreds or old divisions in order to make their case. Yeah. It it all it often feel it often feels these days like no matter what the topic, it's very difficult to find middle ground. Yeah. To have a to have a middle ground discourse irrelevant of the topic. I think we are all we are also polarized sometimes. Mm -hmm. And I know I know for example myself on social media, I have to be careful that I don't let myself become polarized. Yeah. I, I live in an echo chamber of people who believe the same things that I believe. And um, sometimes I need to go out and speak to people with differing opinions. Otherwise I'm part of the polarization. Yes. Um, so I, I do see language as a big potential border. Um, yeah. the, way, the way we speak to each other. Yeah. Um, just on, on, a, on a light note, just for a moment, yeah. when we're talking about maps and borders, I heard the story today of a little girl who had watched her mother just staring at the television screen over the last two days of the American election. And she said to her, Mum, when is the map show going to be over? <laughs> Wanting yeah. to see the end of it, as I think we all probably want to do at this stage. Yes, but now I now, now I know exactly where Nevada is. <laughs> 
But I just want to move this just a little bit sideways for a moment, because one of the other topics which we were looking at um, this evening is what maps are for. And I know Renata in particular is a big fan of maps and all of the things, all of the, the knowledge and the insight that maps can give us. And one of the, um, probably one of the most famous map makers in Ireland over the last 30 years or so was actually an Englishman called Tim Robinson, who moved from England to live in Ireland, to live in Connemara, because he fell in love so much with the landscape. And one of the first things he did was he learned the language, he learned Irish, so that he would understand what the words of the landscape were telling him and that he would be able to map it with more accuracy. And one of the things which I've heard expressed uh, over and over, and I'd love um, Fabio and Katia to come in here as well, I'm, I'm assuming it must be something similar in, in Italy, that we seem, certainly in Ireland anyway, we seem to have this tendency to map every hill, every dale, every stone, everything has to be given a name. It's got to be located as belonging to this particular place. It's not just a mountain range, it's every single mountain has its own individual characteristic. Is that similar with Italian maps or Italian communities, Katia? Well, I suppose it is. Um, I, I think um, I think it's it's an instinct, it's a, it's a practice that uh, involves us all in all cultures. It must be, you know, pertain to all cultures. I'm, I think here, while I hear you talk, I'm reminded of um, uh, something very pertinent that the literary critic Franco Moretti uh, wrote in Atlas of the European Novel, and where he says that uh, geographical spaces are typified by their own histories and their own memories and their own literatures. And, and that's what's so, it's very significant. And it's so, um, it's not sort of national, nation specific, but mm -hmm. it's, um, you know, again, something that can be, that sort of traverses the whole of at least Western culture, as far as I know. So it's, it's a very sort of compelling um, practice that I think yes. most Western culture follow, um, so far as I, I can tell. Yeah, and, and I think one of the one of the big movements of the, the big ordnance survey movement, which took place uh, in Ireland, for example, was back in the 1830s, um, where the ordnance survey project that was undertaken, one of the, the side effects of this was to anglicise the Irish names of different places. So to give them a name in English, it didn't make any sense, but sounded phonetically like the Irish name. And it's really, for me, it's really interesting, Joe, when I go to the north of Ireland, when, for some peculiar reason, the Irish, the original Irish name, even though it's anglicised, retains a much closer relationship to the Irish language than a lot of the, the place names down south, for example. Okay. I remember passing through a tiny little village in Antrim called Strayed, and the, the, the word in Irish for road is Shroyd, and Shroyd Valia. Is a, is a village, just mm -hmm. one one street becomes a town. And I think that one of the things which happens uh, that uh, encouraged or entranced Tim Robinson so much in Connemara was how the old Irish place names of all these places he was mapping told him so much about the countryside that he didn't have to go and learn from other sources. In other words, its history was there in, in its geography and in its place name. Um, but he sent me off looking in, in a slightly different direction also. Um, first of all, what do you, what are the, what are the choices that map makers have to make? What do they leave into a map and what do they leave out? What are the silences? And this was one thing that really interested him. What is omitted from something when the mapping of a place uh, takes place? And there's, um, there's an Irish map maker, a modern map maker called Murish the Butler. And he has created a series of Dublin. He calls it a portrait of Dublin in maps. And what he's done is he has mapped what he calls godlessness. So the city of, of, of Dublin is mapped out as to who believes in what or nothing. So the okay. religion of everybody is mapped on this particular uh, image. Human waste, where he looks at sewers. 
bedsit living, where he looks at the type of accommodation that people have, middle classes, and then those areas which might contain the most crime. Those two are not necessarily separate, by the way. They're just yeah, my yeah. list. And I thought, I never thought of maps as telling us or being able to tell us that much about a city. And it's not just about a city. It's actually about shifts in population, uh, detail about how people live. And apparently back in the, 80, the late 1880s, there was a man called Booth who did something similar in London where he looked at social maps. Can you tell us a little bit about those kind of maps, Fabio? Why I was thinking about, you know, languages, for example, because speaking about Rome, for example, that the, it is the town where I've been living for, uh, I would say, 15 years before coming to Scotland. And I remember that uh, once I met uh, a very close friend of mine and she explained to me that uh, the way that people speak in Rome tells you from where they come in terms of neighborhood. And it was absolutely, absolutely right. Because for example, I don't know if any of you knows Rome well, like me, but the, part, the north part of Rome speak in a way and they behave in a way. So while you were, you were speaking, I realized that probably is a way of mapping the city and mapping the people who live into the city. Mm -hmm. So you can really recognize them just the way they start speaking when you meet them. So it's absolutely uh, something that I can see even in a city like Rome, obviously, like in Dublin. Obviously, it's not something that is physically uh, drawn on a paper, but you can hear, you know, going around the, the street of Rome. Yeah, where, where people come from. Renata, where does your own passion for maps come from? Renata, can you unmute? Yeah, uh, I was, no, I was fascinated with what you were saying. Where do, I mean, what's not to love about a map? It tells you stories, it tells you, you know, limits and it's, it's all, and it tells you how much things change over time. I think I, um, an Italian writer, man, I, I think it was Tabuki, who said that he wanted to keep an atlas of when he was young to give it to his uh, grandchildren so that they could realize that things were, would not always be the same. And something that was red one time could become blue, something which was small would become large. So it's a sense of time that you have nothing, you know, ages as much as a map. As a map, yeah. And yet nothing like a map tells you about the story of a place, you know, naming places like mm -hmm. is, is one of the first, as you, as you said, and uh, giving a soul to a place, yeah. is giving it a name and really animate it and make it alive. Uh, so there is no mountain that doesn't have a legend Absolutely. around it uh, and not to mention rivers. Uh, so yeah. this writer also said that everything changes. So it, he was probably talking about the political situation and the changes of, you know, the changes that history implies. But I was also thinking of how much reflects longer changes. I mean, it's not true that the mountain remains the same. It is mm. not true that the forest remains the same. And it took wars and strategies uh, to make maps the way they are now. Yes. So I think modern maps, I think if you study geography in, at university, you are probably made to look into what do they call, I can't remember the, uh, what it is the military institute that produces these maps. So even nowadays, if you want a really accurate map, you have to go to the military uh, yeah. institution that produce them so they needed maps to make sure that if they attacked something it was not through a bog plan 
but <laughs> because so, they need the access and easy retreat yeah again so i mean waterloo would have probably gone differently if they had known how the territory was uh, if the territory had been correctly mapped so yeah. that is part of my answer but i was collecting also an answer uh, a question for joe here oh. I think people were fascinating of course by a poem and uh, the person asks, I, uh, the question says, uh, has it ever been, um, uh, have, have you ever heard of any translation into Italian of your poem? And how would you, how do you like to be translated? Or what don't you like about being translated into another language? Um. Well, no, I don't. I don't know of any Italian translations. I don't know of any translations of any of my poems, to be quite honest. Um, not yet, anyway. But um, I, I, I know some people see translated poetry as critical, but I actually think it's very interesting. I did a review last year on a collection of poetry by Manuel Rivas, um, Spanish poet um, from Galicia, um, and. I found that such an interesting process. Now, I was very aware at the time that what I was reading was his translator's work. Mm -hmm. um, Lorna Shaughnessy, she had she'd done an absolutely fantastic translation, had managed to keep a tone throughout the book that I am pretty sure was what the original poet wanted. But I think this is where I believe translators get far too little credit. Um, in, in literature, in poetry, um, when when I read translated work, I often think all credit to the poet, but really even more credit to the translator. I have tried myself to translate German poems. It is so unbelievably difficult to get the right word, the right nuance, and keep the intended tone throughout a piece. And that's only in a short poem. Um, so long answer to short question, none of my poems have been translated yet. <laughs> I, yet. Think that's, I think that's really interesting what you say, Joe, about translation. I, I tried, uh, I made an attempt at translating a poem for a reading, one that was in Spanish, to try and uh, uh -huh. give a, an English equivalent. It took me days because it's not, you're not actually translating the words that are on the page. The, the art of the translator is actually reimagining and recreating in their own language that yeah. of the poem that they are translating. And especially poetry. Poetry tends to be very multi-layered. I know certainly when I'm writing a poem, I try, not in every poem, but I do try to build in as many layers as possible with, without making it too taut. Sometimes you can go too far and you can load too much into a poem, but I do try and build in at least a couple of layers. And that's, that's very difficult for a translator to, to get every single cultural layer that you might be talking about. And I think you need to have a real conversation around the piece for it to be translatable. Mm -hmm. um, yes, yeah. And, and, and in your own daily life, how, how difficult or how easy do you find it crossing that border between English and German? Oh, <laughs> well, it depends. It depends. Um, in my day to day life here, I probably speak German 95% of the time. Um, on a normal day, I only speak English at an event like this, or if I'm on the phone to Ireland, um, or if I'm really trying to remind my children that they should speak more English, then I'll. Um, and that's fine. And to switch, what, what I find difficult is when I'm in a, an interpreting modus. Um, if, if I've got both languages surrounding me and I'm interpreting for others, that's when it becomes very, very tiring. But other, otherwise, the switch is okay. And what about writing in German? Has that ever felt that it could be natural for you no. or do you automatically begin in English? No, always in English. I have the greatest respect for anyone who writes in a non-native tongue. A, a friend of mine is German, but she writes poetry purely in English and wonderful poetry. Um, and to me, that just seems not on. I, I, for me, my language is where my nuance is. Um, mm. I, I can't, even though I'm fluent in German, I can't find always exactly the word I want to use. Okay. Um, strangely, but yeah. And can you tell us a little bit about the, the, the upcoming prize that you've been nominated for? Oh, yes. Um, well, it's the Anne Post Irish Book Awards mm -hmm. Poem of the Year. So um, it's about a poem I wrote 
called Terminarch. Um, it was a story that moved me very much a year or so ago about um, the last remaining northern white male rhino um, who died. So his survivors were his daughter and his granddaughter, but there are no males left of the species. So basically, the northern white rhino is now extinct, even though this granddaughter is still alive. And that just to me was a very touching story to be the last of your species, your the endling of a species or the terminarch as such. Um, and so I wrote about that. And um, now that poem won the Listowel single poem prize this year um, and then it's now up for the Irish Book Awards best uh, poem of the year but it, it's got strong competition there's three wonderful po other wonderful poems in there as well so I'm I'm not counting any chickens yeah, so they're they're also in very good company and you're still published by Torres Press isn't yes that right? yes yes so well, we I wish you the very best thank you <laughs> um Renata do we have any other questions from the audience I've just noticed that the time uh, no, it's fascinating the way you produced so many ideas so that we could develop. I mean, I'm so sorry we only have 11 events in this series. <laughs> we could have 100, in fact. But I think you anticipated quite a few of the themes uh, that we'll be dealing with. Uh, and Can, can you tell us about maybe what's coming up next then? On what date? I leave it to Katya. Okay. Because Thank uh, you very much. Next. Yes. Um, <laughs> That, that really, I agree with Renata, that resonated so much with us and with the, um, the topics that are going, going to come up uh, in this very rich series, which begins tonight, but takes us through to late February, if I'm not mistaken, almost the sort of weekly meeting. So please follow uh, the whole series because you'll find um, uh, that, you know, that we're going to cover the ground that's been discussed tonight and, and much more. In particular, I, the thing that struck me um, and was what, what Catherine said about um, the, um, that in maps, what is omitted is as significant, and as important as what is there, what appears. And that strikes me as a, a, the sort of um, the proceedings and, and the manners in which memory works that you know, forgetting and amnesia is as significant as what you remember is what you Absolutely. forget. Yeah. And maps work in similar ways, um, yeah. in a sense. And um, the other thing that really struck a chord with me that Joe jo mentioned earlier was the idea of identities being very fluid and malleable uh, on borders or around borders and, and really quite um, uh, constantly revised. So there's a process of constant revision of borders, um, you know, sort of internal borders. Um, and borders, of course, entail collaboration, but sometimes more frequently they entail confrontation and yeah. uh, fear and anxiety. So all of uh, our meetings uh, in this series are going to touch upon these um, uh, really relevant, wonderful topics. I, I can speak uh, more uh, per you know, in, more in detail about the four meetings that the Italian Culture Institute in London is curating. And we begin next week with uh, the launch of a, of a wonderful book um, with a wonderful title. It, the title is in Italian, Bucare il Confine, which means puncturing the border. So the historian who wrote this text, um, Gabriele Proglio, is intending to puncture the idea of borders. Um, and to, to, um, to conduct a sort of oral history project um, uh, around the border in Ventimiglia, which is a border that migrants have to cross to go from Italy to France. Um, and uh, in our second meeting, which will be towards the end of uh, November, it's a, a meeting about language and borders. So it's about frontalier and language borders in Switzerland. And it's a dialogue between uh, Gabriele Paleari, who's a historian from Nottingham Trent University, and Sergio Savoia, who's a radio um, and broadcaster from Swiss Radio. And again, we're going to talk quite a lot about language and linguistic borders. Uh, also in our December meeting, uh, which deals specifically with an Italian-Croatian author and novelist called Fulvio um, Tomizza, a very well-known uh, novelist in Italy. I wish he was better known in the English language. And uh, he's somebody who's talked about a lot about the psychological dimension of borders and, and feeling the sort of 
almost like the clash of bloods, you know, yes. the Italian and Croatian bloods within him, you know, and, and the clash of languages and cultures, which, you know, existed within him. And finally, our, our final meeting is in, um, in January, early January, where Juliet Fall and Jada Peterle will revisit borders from, um, through the medium of comics and through the medium of eco-feminism. So it's you know, a sort of an entirely different perspective, but a very welcome one. And then I'm sure Renata can, can tell you a little bit more about the meetings organized by Dublin, um, which take us from Dante to Ijaba Shago. It's, it's a very, very rich program. You're certainly covering a lot of ground, no pun yeah. intended. <laughs> yes, we're not mapping the world when making an attempt. At that. No, we will alternate. It, 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 is, very, it, it is very diverse and uh, it's... Um, You'll find the whole program in uh, on our website, right. and I know it, it will be both uh, on uh, the website of the Institute in London and that of uh, Dublin, and I think also the website of Edinburgh. And uh, yes, right after the um, the meeting with uh, Gabriele Proglio, we will deal with the whole the, the very concept of geography uh, the that event will be in italian it is the geographer franco farinelli and he is um, perhaps the greatest geographer in, in italy and he deals with the crisis of this what he calls a ragion cartografica cartographic region so the way that we look at the map as if the map was exactly the territory. Okay. It is not. We trick ourselves for explicit or implicit yeah. reasons, and it, he he goes very deep into into that, and it is a fascinating way of looking of at maps in a way which tells us so very much about the history of maps. Then we will alternate with with London. Uh, and the following uh, event in Dublin is in January. Um, and Ijaba Shego. Um, Ijaba Shego is a, a young uh, Italian writer whose uh, uh, family originally comes from Africa. So she is also, uh, it is extremely important for her to deal with that form of identity, being okay. a, an African Italian with all that culture behind and around her so she will talk uh, she will tell us about her latest novel which actually deals with uh, also another border that uh, between um, not only between Italy and uh, uh, and the um, colonial adventures of Italy mm -hmm. but also with uh, uh, the story of young Ameri black American women coming to Europe. So okay. it, the title of the book is La Linea del Confine. She will talk in English and she will deal with the themes of, you know, identity across this, this what she calls La Linea del Colore, the line of color. Oh, so, okay. yeah. And after that, so we move to paradise. <laughs> And it is Alessandro Scaffi, who actually lives in London, lives and uh, works in London. He is from the Warburg Institute, and he will talk about maps of paradise, uh, a visual history of heaven and hell. Okay. So he will really deal with that theme of visualizing uh, imag you know, imaginary lands, in fact. Then we move back to Earth uh, with uh, Tiziana Francesca Vaccaro. She studies... Uh, what we now call, and it has a name, it has a, you know, definite characteristics, what we call Syndrome Italia, it's Italy Syndrome. It is a disease, uh, a mental illness uh, that has been found among, uh, uh, especially women that work in Italy as what we call badanti, so caregivers okay. who left their homeland, spend their many years in Italy, very seldom returning where they come from and losing their identity okay. and uh, developing this kind of syndrome. Um, so the, uh, the actress Tiziana Francesca Vaccaro has spoken to these people, uh, collected their stories and put together the material for 
a theatrical performance, uh, which she is preparing and presenting to us uh, in, you know, not in a theat theatrical form, but uh, uh, giving us the behind the scene of what she is, uh, is doing. That will be in uh, Italian. And then uh, the two events in, in February are very different. One is neuroscience, you know, and linguistics. And the other one is philosophy and culinary. So it's how we look at food from a philosophical perspective and how borders have so much to do with the way we look at cutting food, for instance. So uh, you'll find out more about these events on our website. We'll have a short description of each of them. And um, I hope I hope you spread the right, word. So about it's, a, it's a busy winter, a busy winter and a busy spring coming up by the sounds of it. What we're here for. Yes. <laughs> So, and, it, yes. Sorry. I would. I would like to to thank you so very much, Joe and Catherine. I hope you come back to these events. It's been so great. Very happily. Well, th so. thank thank you so much, Renata, for organizing it. And I mean, listening to that program. I mean, I think you're going to see me here as a guest most weeks. That sounds exactly <laughs> what we wanted. <laughs> and I know that our public has been a little bit shy this time, but I hope we. Um, We'll have more questions next time. Uh, we're delighted to have you with us, although virtually. Um, we would love to offer you a glass of wine. Um, <laughs> and that was the normal conclusion of our events here at the Institute. We hope the winter is not too hard and long and we can resume the old habits again with much more you know good experiences uh, to put on the table so well i hope we've left our audience with plenty of food for thought anyway and <laughs> we certainly look forward to so many of those events that you've outlined thank you very much for putting this together renata and to everybody who joined in the conversation thank, thank you thank you thank you thank you, thank you. Thank you. Uh, see you soon see you Good in london <laughs> Look forward to seeing you next week. Thanks, okay. Bye bye. Cheers. Bye bye. 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 bye.